Good afternoon, everyone. How, how are things going? Does anyone have any questions? For you guys at home, do you have any questions? Can you hear me all right? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay. Hey, Evan. Um, anyone try to look at the video, the recorded videos, one, or the recorded video? I was actually just looking at it, yeah. Did it, uh, was it um, watchable? Yeah. Was there, okay, good. So I didn't see any issues with it. One of my other classes, it wasn't recording properly, but all right. Um, okay, so um, I decided to take this uh, chapter one and break it into two slide decks. So if you go onto Canvas now, you'll see two separate slide decks and uh, part one and part two. So we've done half of part one and we'll finish that today and then we'll enter into the second slide deck um i also updated the lecture notes so what what will happen here is um what will be common for the course everything will change uh right up until maybe the last day of classes so i would suggest please do not print out uh lecture notes or slide decks because um that they're just it's going to be a moving target for you and you might end up just wasting paper uh that said uh, some some of you are like me or you know your old older citizens senior citizens i don't know uh and you like to have physical copies in your hand and i understand that so um i do a little better these days with an ipad because i feel like it's almost like paper so whatever you need to do to make make things work for you Go ahead and do that. But in any case, uh, as I said, uh, this is the wrong one. <laughs> okay. And there we go. There we go. So um, we already covered the first two topics, Sterling's approximation and integral with a large parameter. And uh, some of you graciously sent me corrections, uh, pointed out typos, and I think I've incorporated those into both the lecture notes and the uh, slide deck. So thank you for that. So we finished talking about um, approximating the integral uh, that we introduced IX for large values of X. Um, and we discussed how it's not always a good idea to think about these. Uh, the utility of these is not as X is fixed and then taking larger and larger values of N. The utility is thinking about N fixed and taking larger and larger values of X. In that sense, the approximations get better and better. That is, as the large parameter gets uh, larger and larger. So, there were two themes that we discussed. The one was the relative error computation that we use in Sterling's approximation. Second was getting these weird expansions series, um, which didn't converge, but have some nice properties otherwise. I will also mention that, um, uh, so for these expansions that we created here, uh, they're a bit weird, right? Because the expansions are not power series, they're kind of inverse power series. And if you've uh, taken a complex analysis course, you'll have seen series like this before. They're they're called the Ront series, okay? Where you have uh, a, the, the powers appear as reciprocals powers. Um, that's okay. We're, we're gonna be developing a lot of uh, things like this, but the idea is fairly similar. Um, one person's power series is another person's Laurent series, right? So you can just throw in a reciprocal. Think about X getting large, that's like another parameter getting small, okay? So not a huge deal. <clears throat> so we explored two problems and now we're going to discuss another one. And that is the problem of algebraic equations with a small parameter. So what do we mean here? So by algebraic equations, I really mean algebraic equations. 
in this case, a, a, a polynomial or a quadratic equation with a small parameter epsilon. So what do we mean by a small parameter epsilon? Well, first of all, if I don't say otherwise, we'll always assume that uh, our epsilon are small parameters and our large parameters, we'll, we'll call them lambda sometimes or z or x, are real numbers. Now, we can think about them as uh, complex numbers, but we have to be a little bit careful because um, complex numbers, as you know, um, well, th there are some inherent uh, difficulties with that, which we'll discuss when we get to them. But for now, epsilon's a positive number. And by small, I haven't said yet what small means. And the important thing in asymptotic expansions is there are degrees of smallness. Okay, there are degrees in of smallness and there are degrees of largeness as well, I guess, if you want to say. But for now, we'll use um, a sort of um, understanding that this will all be defined in uh, much greater detail later. Small means small. Um, oftentimes, we'll signif uh, signify this by saying that epsilon is much, much less than one, but that has no meaning either unless you give it some meaning. And, We'll have to do that. But this is a colloquial expression that most people understand pretty well. Um, so this this um, equation has two solutions, right? Uh, quadratic formula can be applied to compute these two solutions. And we get them as these pairs, x1 and x2 of epsilon. If I change epsilon, then I get a different solution. And of course, it's fairly easy here to find out what the solutions would be whenever epsilon is equal to zero, although in some sense, epsilon equals zero isn't allowed. That's, uh, that's, that's a off limits because we're, we want epsilon to be positive. But we can think about that as being the sort of uh, base case or the, the limiting case. If I set epsilon equals zero, then I can solve this fairly easily. One of the solutions is clearly zero and the other one should be two. All right, but we're interested in the case where epsilon is small but positive. We could also be interested in small but negative, right? In any case, here are our two solutions. And um, if we put in epsilon equals zero, as I said, we get zero and two. But how can we come up with a nice expansion or expression that uh, doesn't involve this radical, which will allow us to compute quick and dirty approximations of these solutions for different values of small epsilon? Um, and of course, you can also cheat and plug in uh, the values into your calculator or you know have some sort of program which calculates these things numerically, these things are probably using something like Newton's method in the background. They're not doing things algebraically. They're doing things what I, in, a, in a manner I would call numerical, numerical approximations. Okay, so calculator will, the square root function works per perfectly fine using some sort of algorithm like Newton's method to compute it. And so you can put in epsilon values and compute those, but I want to come up with a different way. So one other way is to use the binomial series expansion. So you've probably seen the binomial theorem. So the binomial theorem applies to things like, suppose I want to expand one plus T to the power three. And you've probably seen Pascal's triangle. And so you know how to do, do this in a quick and dirty fashion, but um, you also know how to uh, compute these things combinatorially, right? Using uh, n choose, k choose n or something like that. So now what I'm interested in is the case where alpha is not, um, alpha is not a, a positive integer. So does this make sense? The answer is yes. Um, for example, if alpha is equal to a half, then I... I'm asking for an expansion for one plus T to the one half power. And uh, the binomial expansion gives that to us. In fact, you know, it's, it's not hard to see that if T is less than one in absolute value, then this expansion converges and you can use a ratio test to confirm that. 
So if alpha is equal to half, I'm just going to plug in a half here, 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 and get all these coefficients. And this should produce some sort of power series, which converges for all t uh, less than or equal to one, which is what I'm interested in here. I'm going to apply this whenever, instead of using t, I have an epsilon where epsilon really is a small parameter. And so this would be valid. So for example, uh, let's choose epsilon between zero and one and alpha to be equal to a half. So we can do one minus epsilon. Um, so instead of using T here, we'll use minus epsilon or, or just replace T with minus epsilon. And so I could write this as one plus a minus epsilon. Okay, so T is minus epsilon, alpha is equal to a half, and we're good to go. We can do this expansion and we're, we're gonna get something like this. But this is still using the framework of the um, Pythagorean theorem, right? Or not the Pythagorean theorem, the uh, quadratic formula, sorry. Um, we're plugging this in to here and here, and then adding or subtracting a one as necessary, or subtracting or adding that expansion to one, I should say. So in this case, we're going to get the two expansions here and here. And so we can see that um, if I put in epsilon equals zero, then formally I get uh, a zero and a two, right? But if epsilon is small, I get actual an actual expansion. And so if epsilon is say 0.1, I can put in numbers here and then I can throw away terms that might be extremely small, not contribute. And so I can make nice approximations of my roots. This is all kind of elementary. But let me show you another method which doesn't use the quadratic formula and it doesn't use the binomial series expansion as we've used here, something that's wholly new and different. Notice that whenever I did or applied the binomial series expansion, I got a power series in terms of epsilon for my two roots. Now, there are two solution branches for this, this uh, problem, right? There are two solutions for every given epsilon. I can, I can show that rigorously. That's not hard to see. So I expect to have these two different branches. So one has a starting point of probably zero, and the other one has a starting point of two, and then I create these branches from there. But in either case, they're both power series expansions in epsilon. And so I could start with this assumption, but from the point of view of saying, well, I don't know this. I don't know this coefficient or this one, right? And put those in as unknowns and then try to generate some sort of uh, system of equations for generating the coefficients given certain starting values. Okay, so this is what we're going to do uh, with this thing we call the perturbation method. We're going to make two expansions. Formally, they're more or less the same they have different starting values, i equals one and two. Okay, so I have to, de to determine all of these terms in this power series expansion. So how am I going to do this? I'm gonna plug this expression into the equation, namely this equation 10, plug that in formally, expand, um, you can square these series just by assuming that I can multiply the two series together. And um, I'm, I'm guessing you know how to do that, or you've seen that done before. So we, did, we won't cover that. So formally, I plug this in to the equation, do my expansions. There's only one expansion here to be done, or one, um, one multiplication. I have to do the the series x i epsilon times itself. And you know how to, to do the do the terms of that expansion. And then I'm going to gather all the terms which have an epsilon to the power zero, that is no epsilon, essentially, or epsilon zero is just equal to one. So I'm going to gather all of those equations or all of those terms and make an equation from that. I'll gather all of the terms that are the coefficients for the epsilon to the first power. So all I'm just all I'm doing is equating the coefficients of like powers of epsilon. So there's epsilon to the first, epsilon second, and cube, and so on. I can keep going like this. The um, these uh, 
these equations get longer and longer each time I go to a higher and higher power. Okay, so let's notice what we have. For the first uh, equation, we have xi0 squared minus 2xi0 equals 0. So there are two possibilities here, right? I can take, uh, I have x equals to 0 or x equals to 2 will sol solve this problem. So I'm going to take one of those and set i equals 1 and the other i equals 2. So let's take for i equals 1, let's start with the 0. And for i equals 2, let's start with the 2. Now, that's the only quadratic equation that appears for us. After this, we notice that there are no other quadratic equations appearing. Now, you might say that's not true exactly because here's a quadratic. But look what happens. Once I solve this equation, I fully determine x i 0 for i equals 1 and 2. Okay, so that's that fully determines that one and that one. So these I call my two different solution branches. Now I move on after I determine x i 0, i equals 1 and 2, to figuring out what x i 1 should be. So from this point on, I have to choose one of the branches and follow that because I have to put in to my equation x i 0. So I'm either going to choose for my first branch to take this one or the second branch to take this one. And choosing what branch I'm on determines the whole expansion. So let's suppose we take 0. If I put 0 in there, then that means that that term goes away and I only have this term to solve, which says that x i1, I guess this is x11, is going to be a half, okay, and so on. So notice also that for each step, after the first, I'm solving only a linear problem, okay? And all, I do, all I've done so far is I've made this expansion ansatz, that's the term of art, ansatz, just means a an assumption about the shape or structure of. So using this solution ansatz, plugging into the original equation, equating powers of epsilon, I come up with this recursive system. After the first, they're all linear. And so I can determine x11 linearly, x12 linearly by solving this guy. So even though this is quadratic, that x11 was determined at the previous step. So it's going to come in as something determined. And what I'm going to, what's undetermined then is x12 and x12. So I can solve for that. Those are all going to be linear all the time. The next thing I'm going to solve for is x13. That's also going to be linear. There are, of course, quadratic pairings using stuff that came before, but that doesn't matter because that's all known stuff. So now, as I said, we once we choose one of the solution branches, whichever one we're on, and it seems like they fixed the heat issue that they're having. It's kind of warm in here. Um, once I've decided which solution branch I'm living on, then I can go ahead and solve for all of the unknowns in my expansion. Now, whether or not that expansion that I determine is going to be a convergent expansion and for what values of epsilon it's convergent, that is not clear. But formally, I can do this uh, mechanically, right? Generate this expansion. And notice that this agrees exactly with the expansion that I produced using the binomial series expansion. So the first ones were one half, one eighth, one sixteenth. The second one was, uh, well, after the zero, there was a zero here. Then of course the first one is two and then minus one half, minus one eighth, minus one sixteenth. Okay. So this method doesn't know anything about the, uh, the quadratic formula. It doesn't know anything about um, series or the, the binomial series expansion. The only thing I have to know how to do here is not series, series, not series. Go away. There you go. Series and series are close together, I guess. Um, so um, 
So this doesn't know anything about the quadratic formula. It doesn't know anything about binomial series expansions. Very rudimentary. All I have to know how to do is multiply series together, which is done by the most obvious method that you would come up with. So this method is called the perturbation method, the per perturbation technique. It's not the only one. As I said, we have quadratic formula. We have the one involving binomial series expansion. There's also another procedure called the iterative procedure, which is, you know, it's not a great name because this is also an iter iterative procedure. This one is the perturbation method. So it starts out, you make this uh, expansion ansatz, plug it into the equation, weight like powers of epsilon, choose a branch to go on to. And once you choose the branch you're on to, you can do the expansions and that should give you a reasonable uh, approximation. Now, here it's not clear whether or not the thing we're com constructing or getting in the end is actually a convergent series, right? So there, it looks like there's going to be involved a little bit analysis on the back end, but that's okay. This is a formal approach and uh, you know, if, if you just want to calculate solutions, this is a perfectly fine way to do it. So our, there are a number of open questions associated with what we've just done. Like, is it valid, right? Anytime you write down a power series, the question is, does that thing converge? So mathematicians worry and wring their hands about these things all the time. Um, physicists don't worry about these things so much and that's okay. Um, that's what we're here for. Mathematicians are there to worry about things that physicists and engineers don't. That's okay. Um, so are the manipulations that, that we've done justified? Are they, are they okay? Is that expansion that we chose, is that the right one? Is that justified? For example, why not take another type of expansion? Why not expand in powers of epsilon to the one half power? So epsilon one half to the first power, epsilon to the one half to the second power, right? Which is just epsilon and so on. Epsilon to, to the one half power to the third power, which is epsilon to the three halves. Or could we expand in uh, a power series of epsilon squared terms, right? So that our terms are epsilon squared, epsilon fourth, epsilon sixth, and so on. Will either of these expansions work? If we plug these into our equation, will we miss something? There must have been something about what we guessed. Well, ours was an informed guess, right? We said, let's use this one because we knew from our, ex um, our experience using the binomial series expansion that we actually did get powers of epsilon. So that informed our choice to use that particular type of expansion. But why does that work and why does something else not work? Okay, so uh, any other questions that you guys can think of? What else might you worry about? What a, is this going to lead to the correct answer, right? Um, is it going to just be mush in the end? Is it going to be something It's going to lead to a solution which is usable in some sense? So it turns out actually... For the same reason that using the binomial series expansion was useful, the you know just getting a few terms of this series to make an approximation for small values of epsilon is gives yields quite good approximations, and you can you can determine that just by doing a comp comparison with what you get in the approximations with what you get from your calculator, which is trustworthy enough to put men and women on the moon. I don't actually know if there's any women ever been on the moon, but trustworthy enough to get people on the moon. All right. I don't mean to beat a dead horse here, but you know, let's do another example, which is more or less the same. Uh, suppose we have a cubic equation with a small parameter. Is there anything different here? What would you expect? Well, if I have a, if I have a cubic equation with a small parameter, um, I'm still going to expect to get, in general, three solution lines, right? Uh, if I set epsilon equal to zero, I still have three solution lines, but that should determine where the branches of the solutions that I'm going to choose, okay? So how do things go in that sense? Um, so let's dispense with computing uh, the solutions of the cubic uh, 
exactly using uh, the formula that were developed in the 15th century and known since then, and just go right into the perturbation approach and see what happens. And this time we'll neglect to use that cumbersome second index I. Um, so before I put an I here, but that gets a little old quickly. Um, so we'll neglect that for now. Substitute the expansion into the uh, cubic equation. Now we've got a little bit harder of a time because we have to multiply that onzot series times itself three times, right? We have to take the third power of the series. And that's, you know, that's not so fun to do, but you can do it. And, and if you wonder what I'm talking about, just take three power series, the same copy of itself three times and, and, and multiply itself times itself three times, okay? Or cube a series and see what you get. And just see if you can come up with a process for doing that, what makes sense, what works. Um, so. Let's throw it in the series. Um, do our, let's see, we have to, we have to cube that series. Um, thankfully, we don't have to square the series as well, although that would just be a part of cubing the series, I suppose. Um, and so, right, so we don't, this is really the only thing that's going to cost us a lot of effort. Okay, throw it in, collect power, collect terms with like powers of epsilon and um, see what see what equations you get. So we, we're going to get another recursive uh, system of equations, starting with sort of base uh, equation. And here's something a bit strange happens. So we get three possible roots, which we expected, but two of them are the same. Uh, so the question is, do they produce two separate solution branches or is it going to be the same solution branch? You know, how do I get off the same one? Actually, I lied, right? Uh, they are There are three distinct ones. I thought it was one repeated. So the question is, what happens when you have a repeated uh, root for the perturbation method? Does it get stuck on a single branch or can you can you do something to get into multiple branches? Um, so that's something you might want to think about. So here we're okay. I, I I misread that. It's zero plus one and minus one. So those are the three. So three separate expansions, depending on which one you start with. And of course, you just follow the branches as you go, right? I'm going to pick, let's say, start with x zero equals zero, and then I can determine from here x one. Uh, if x0 is just 0, then this guy is non-existent, so x1 is just equal to 1, and so on and so forth. Each equation step, or each iteration, is going to give me a linear equation that I have to solve. So the hard or heavy lifting only comes from the first, and this is important because we don't want to create a problem which is harder than the one we started with. If somewhere along the line you have to solve a quintic equation, then why not just stick with the simple cubic and, you know, uh, save yourself from work. But you can see that we, it's, it's pretty clear what happens. We don't run into any extra effort uh, as we go along. In fact, things always stay pretty much the same. We simply have to solve linear equations. Now, there are more terms at each iteration that appear. So more and more terms sort of stack up on each other. And so there's this sort of combinatorial complexity associated with, you know, keeping track of numbers and multiplying them, things like that, but no extra effort in terms of solution uh, work because each one is, an is a linear equation. So I guess I lied again. Let's take the first one. Let's take the X not equals one branch and see what we get. If we do that then uh, the first equation is this linear equation, which yields x1 equals minus a half. The second equation, now we can plug back in x0 and x1, and we can solve for x2, and that yields x2 equals minus three-eighths. The third order equation, I plug in x1, x, or x0, x1, x2, yields a linear equation for x3, and you can see where the combinatorial complexity starts to creep in with all the terms that are appearing. 
but uh, the solution complexity is kind of the same in the sense that I'm still only having to solve a linear equation. X3 is equal to minus a half and so on. So for the X equals one branch, I can determine the power series expansion that uh, relates to the onsatz I've assumed. And so we can ask the question, well, does this, does this power series converge? Uh, how big does epsilon have to be for it to converge, et cetera? And you can show pretty easily that this is going to converge for epsilon sufficiently small. No problem there. And these do give very good approximations to the uh, to the to the to the roots um, as epsilon gets small, but is not exactly equal to zero. I can do the same thing for the x equals zero and x equals minus one branches. For the x equals zero branch, going out to third order, I find that I get this approximation. You can keep going. I don't know. Maybe this will always uh, just produce an odd order, order expansion. That would be interesting to see. And for the x zero equals minus one branch, we get something like that. Stopping at the cubic term, because we're going to assume that epsilon to the fourth power is sufficiently small that we can uh, we don't have to go on. Okay. So again, as I said, the beauty of this method is I don't have to know anything about solving uh, cubic uh, equations exactly. So those complicated formulas that they came up with in the 15th century and the 16th century aren't going to keep me up at night because I don't have to worry about those. Um, I can just sort of plug in my uh, initial guess, get you know, determining which branch I'm on, and just compute the numbers as I as I see fit. Each iteration is going to be or require the solution of a linear equation, so it's all doable. Nothing, no heavy machinery. The only heavy machinery that I require is multiplying power series or cubing the power series in this case. Questions? So this is what's called a perturbation method or a perturbation technique. Everything looks fine, right? So now we wanna break this method, right? We wanna stretch it and see when does it, when does it fail. So the reason why this works is because whenever I put in or study the base case or the limiting case, epsilon equals zero, I don't change the structure of the problem in any great way. In, a, in other words, in both of the last two examples, when I was stuck in epsilon equals zero, in the first case, I still had a quadratic equation whenever I had epsilon equals zero. And in the second case, I still had a cubic equation to solve whenever epsilon was equal to zero. So these types of problems are what we call regular perturbation problems, where if I put in the base case, I get more or less the same problem structure that I started with. I don't radically change the problem structure. Uh, and a, a very simple solution on Zots, like the ones I've been assuming, work perfectly well and give us everything we need to know. The one thing that uh, might trouble you is what happens when we have a double root, because that requires some ingenuity about how you start because you want these you we would expect these two branches to go from one starting place to two different branches so really like a, literally a branch coming or emanating from the same point let's neglect that for now and talk about what happens when we put in epsilon equals zero and we radically change the structure of the problem that's called a singular perturbation problem and requires a little bit extra attention or um, uh, care whenever dealing with that. So the only things we've dealt, dealt with so far are the regular perturbation cases. That is whenever I put in or examine the base case or the limiting case, and I still get a problem which has the same structure as the one that I started with, albeit maybe a simpler one. In this case, we're going to study a singularly perturbed cubic problem where whenever I put in epsilon equals zero, I radically change the structure of the equation. So notice that whenever I put in epsilon equals zero here, I get a linear equation, which has only one solution. 
rather than a cubic equation, which has three solutions. So that's going to tell me I've only got one branch to play with, where I know I'm going to have three branches in general. So that's one tip off that things are about to go wrong. But if you try to play the game using the rules that uh, you've used in the past, you'll eventually get to a sort of conundrum. For example, if I use the standard onsatz, plug that into the equation, do my expansions, equate powers of epsilon, I immediately see that there's a problem because the order uh, zero equation, this is what we also call the leading order equation, So the leading order is the epsilon zero or whatever the first one is. Sometimes the leading order is epsilon to the minus two or epsilon to the minus one. It's whatever the first one would be. And I'll we'll talk more about that thing as uh, time goes on. So the leading order or the zeroth order problem is only linear. And so this leads to a problem because this is only going to give us one branch. Namely, the x uh, zero equals one branch, minus one branch, right? The other two are somehow lost. So the question is, what happens to them? Well, you're perfectly fine in trying to compute the br that that branch by chugging along. Once I know that, uh, and actually, let's check this. So x naught would be minus one. That was that that is one of the solutions, right? Um, if I go on to choose x naught uh, or, or or compute x1, then I'm going to use x naught minus 1. So here, this will be minus 1. That'll be known, right? So I get minus 1 minus x1 equals 0. Right? So that's x1 is equal to minus 1. Okay, so it looks like it's working, but I'm only getting one solution branch. I'm never going to get any more than that. So what's happening in this case? Well, what, what's happening is if, if you do a little experiment using um, uh, MATLAB or some computer algorithm uh, software, com com computer software that you can track these roots, you'll see that what's happening as epsilon gets smaller and smaller is that uh, two of these solutions are escaping to infinity. And one of them's kind of staying finite. It's moving around in the plane or the real line a little bit. It, typically, these are in the complex plane. Okay, but we're, uh, we have solutions which are in the real line. Um, so one of them stays in a nice neighborhood in, in the real line, stays finite. But the other two are migrating off to infinity kind of rapidly. The question is, can we quantify how rapidly they're moving off to infinity? Can we gain a a series expansion that uh, tracks how these things are going off to infinity because we might want to we might want to give a small epsilon approximation for this okay so this is what we're going to try to do with the with the next technique that I'll introduce okay so what do we do well we notice that the, reg the, the, the standard onsatz works quite well whenever we have a regular perturbation problem. We plug in the series, we generate some terms, and everything seems to work out fine, right? So what we're going to do now is make a change of variables. That's what you should always do, okay? Okay, always be changing, A, B, C. V, always be changing variables, okay? So try that first and see if you can come up with something. So the method we're going to use to determine what is the right change of variables, because remember, you have an infinite number of choices for changing variables, uncountably infinite. Uh, so the question is, what's the right one? So what we want to do is change variables in such a way as that we produce a problem, which should be cubic, right? But should be regular, okay? And a couple other things. So here's how we're going to do it. Instead of using x, 
let's uh, introduce a new variable, y, where y is equal to epsilon to some power alpha, which is unknown, times x. Okay. So now if epsilon was equal to zero, this is not useful because it changes the problem in no way at all. So uh, we're going to assume that uh, alpha is not equal to zero. Now it could be negative as well, I suppose. Um, it turns out that it's not. But let's substitute that in and see what we get with our equation. So if we do substitute that, then we're going to get an equation which looks like this. Okay, some new powers of epsilon out front. Remember, we had an epsilon to the first power before, but since we're cubing this thing, we're going to also get epsilon to the three alpha power in the denominator. Here, we just get epsilon alpha, replacing x using the formula You can do it like this, y over epsilon alpha, okay? Okay, so using that formula, plugging in everywhere I see x and cubing or squaring, whatever I need to do, I'm gonna get a new equation. So this is the equation. So the question is, what do I do and how do I determine uh, which is, again, the right epsilon to use? I'm going to use a procedure known as the method of dominant balance. And it works like this, or the principle of dominant balance. I'm going to assume, I should say that somewhere. I'm going to assume that my y and y to any power is going to be order one. Now, I haven't told you what order one means yet, but order one means it doesn't depend on epsilon. Okay. So it stays roughly. If it's if it's ten and I cube it, it's just going to be ten cubed. It's not going to go like it's going to not going not going to blow up. Won't get very big. Won't get very small. It's order one. Now I do have to come back. We have to come back and and nail some of these ideas down, make them clear. Right? Uh, we're just simply trying to motivate what we want to do later. So there are going to be some uh, loose threads uh, that we need to tie up later on. So, roughly speaking you have an idea of what order one means, okay? But we need to define that. For now, I'm simply gonna say y and all of its powers are assumed to be order one. In the, in the principle of dominant balance, what I'm gonna do is then I'm gonna take the coefficients that, that appear here, that, that one, that one, and that one, and I'm gonna demand that two of them balance, in fact, I'm, it's usually always going to be the first and one of the other balance in their powers of epsilon. And that those two terms dominate the other coefficients or powers of epsilon appearing in the other terms as epsilon goes to zero. So what do I mean by that? Does epsilon, as epsilon goes to zero, does that dominate? And for dominating, we're going to use this notation. Would it dominate an order one term. No, epsilon gets small, order one stays order one. But what about epsilon to the minus one? As epsilon gets small, this gets very large, so that starts to dominate an order one term. Okay, and so we're going to play this game. Uh, so when we choose two terms that should balance, that should pick for us our value of our value of alpha. Once we have alpha, then we can ask: Do the two terms that I've used to set my alpha from from my balance does that dominate everything else? So there's the balance and there's the domination. That's the method or the principle of dominated balance. Okay, so I'm going to balance two terms. Usually the first one. The reason why I want to choose the first one is because I want that to appear and stay put. So I need that to be big. The problem in the original problem was this guy did not dominate these terms. This is epsilon. Does order epsilon dominate order one as epsilon goes to zero? Not a chance. So I want to choose a rescaling so that the power or the coefficient here balances with one of the other terms and dominates all the others. 
so that it stays put as epsilon gets smaller. Okay. Okay, so those, those are what I have to balance. So let's balance the first one and the second term. Okay, the first two terms. And then let's pick the first and the third term and check, see what we get. Okay, so here's the equation. I've simplified it a little bit. So let's suppose that the first and second terms balance in their powers of epsilon. What does that mean? That means that one minus, uh, the, the minus sign here doesn't matter. So we're just doing absolute value. So that means one minus three alpha is equal to minus alpha. Okay. So that means one equals two alpha or alpha equals a half. If I plug alpha equals two and a half back in, and again, I'm going to assume all my terms involving alpha, alpha to the first power, squared, cubed, all order one. Okay, then the first and second terms in this case are going to be order epsilon to the minus one. So as epsilon gets smaller, small, this term blows up, right? This term gets big. So the question is, does this big term dominate whatever's left over? Well, whatever's left over is going to be epsilon to the zero power. Okay, the last term is epsilon zero or order one. So the question is, does this guy, does a term like this dominate order one? And the answer is yes. As epsilon goes to zero, epsilon to the half becomes much larger than one. So the way we write that is epsilon to the minus one half dominates one. So that is a possibility. That's balancing the first and second terms and dominating the third term. Let's try balancing the first and third terms and dominating the second term. Now, remember, in our dominant balance, we're always keeping the first term. So we just do this combinatorially. One and two, then one and three. Uh, then I've also done the, first, the second and third terms, but they're not going to count. Okay. And in fact, it just doesn't work anyway. So let's do the second one, first and third terms balance. So this means one minus three alpha has to be equal to zero, which says that epsilon, uh, I think that should say alpha. Alpha, right? If that happens, one minus three alpha equals zero, then alpha has to be equal to one third. So this is a typo. Alpha equals one third. Okay. If alpha equals one third, then that, that could be okay. This is epsilon to the zero, so that's order one. This is also order one. This is epsilon to the minus one third power, right? That gets big as epsilon gets small. So order one cannot dominate that term. So that one doesn't work. That one doesn't satisfy dominant balance. So we're going to reject that one. Now, the second and third terms could also balance and dominate the, the, the first one. But this is kind of what we were trying to avoid in the first place, right? And so this scenario is going to be rejected because the only dominant balance we really want is the one that uh, is different from what we started with, OK? Well, there's some other criteria in there as well, but we certainly don't want to do what we started with. That didn't work. So if the second and third terms balance in their power of epsilon, this implies that alpha is equal to zero, but that's the original problem. Okay, You can see that definitely doesn't work. So dominant balance fails. We have to choose number one, Okay, which is alpha equals a half, and therefore it's going to give us our problem. If alpha is equal to a half, then the problem transforms to the following. All right, that's fine. I, but I don't like to deal with so many epsilons. So let's multiply everywhere by epsilon to the one half power because epsilon is a positive parameter. It doesn't matter if I multiply through by epsilon to the one half power. Multiplying by a constant doesn't change the structure of the equation in any real way. Now, you might say, why didn't I just do that in the first problem, right? Why don't you just divide out by the epsilon and make the first term have a coefficient of 1 over epsilon? 
or sorry, just one. Well, the problem is that is going to be an order one, but now these guys become order one over epsilon. Think about dominant balance. They'll balance and dominate this term, and that's definitely not what I want. Okay, so I really haven't done anything structurally by multiplying through by a power of epsilon. You don't do anything by multiplying by powers of epsilon. You do something by changing variables. So try to change your variables first. That's where you're going to get real change. So the problem that I end up with is this one. But notice that that's pretty much exactly the regular perturbation problem that I just solved in the previous section, right? The only difference is, well, what it, what was the difference? Yeah, it's just plain old epsilon rather than epsilon to the one half. So what do you think we ought to do then? It ought, ought to tell us maybe we should change our ansatz, right? Because previously epsilon to the first power, power series and epsilon to the first power worked well. So this is going to tell us from time to time you need to do your, the ansatz that you assume might not work out, right? If I use a, an expansion in epsilon, it's not going to be right. I need to do an expansion in terms of epsilon to the one half powers. And so the, the correct ansatz is going to be this. Notice that now I'm working in the variable y, not the variable x. I don't shift back for any reason yet. But since the last term appears with the power epsilon, this is the correct ansatz. And I think you can, can see why. Makes sense, right? So now you plug that into the equation. We're going to have to do a cube uh, of a power series as before, but actually everything is really just the same. If you look at it, the sequence of equations that we get is exactly the same as before. There are going to be three branches. The first one, only, the only difference is we're working with y0, y1, and y2 rather than x0, x1, and x2. Right? Everybody see that? But, and, and the power series is different because it's a power series in epsilon to the one half power. It's not an integral power series in epsilon. But we still, all the mechanics are exactly the same. And you'll see that, well, you just get these three solution branches out in the end. Okay, so that looks like we've just shifted to a regular uh, perturbation problem, which we have. And um, in this new variable, this is what we have. But what what happens when we shift back? That should then capture what's really going on in this problem with the solutions escaping to infinity, right? So that's what we want to do. Let's, we know that alpha is equal to a half, right? And so X is going to be related to Y through this equation, this change of variables or unchanged of variables. And so that if we convert back to uh, X land, we get these three branches. And notice that the initial um, expansion or the initial value in my expansion is not order one. It's order epsilon the minus one. And those are our three branches. This guy is blowing up as epsilon goes to zero. Um, of course, it all the rest of this stuff is um, more or less irrelevant as epsilon gets small, the leading order blow up is epsilon to the minus one half. So that's telling us how that's blowing up. Now, what would have happened if we would have started from the very beginning of guessing the right asymptotic expansion to begin with? In other words, what if instead of starting out with the assumption that we need to expand Because that's that's essentially what we did, right? Now, what would have happened if rather than guess that, we would have guessed the correct structure? Okay, so what is the correct structure? X minus one, I guess, epsilon, the minus one half. 
plus x0 epsilon to 0 plus x1 epsilon to the 1 half plus x2 epsilon. So really all we've done is kind of determine the correct starting point for our expansion. And if I plug this guy into the equation and <clears throat> equate light powers of epsilon, then I get the correct expansions. I get three different branches. I'll start off with the correct number of initial states. Only The, the only difference is now we're going to start off with x minus 1 instead of x0. Now you could shift everything and just call this x0 if you wanted, and then this one would be x1, x2, x3, so on. You can do whatever you want with naming your naming convention. That's not a big deal. But what is important is you you really need to know what is the correct onsatz to put in for your expansion. Sometimes we're going to learn <clears throat> in this class that we need to sub substitute in weird things. Like, for example, our ex the expansion we might want to put in should be something like x epsilon, uh, g to the power epsilon, and then a proper exper expansion. So, we're going to use a lot of different techniques to try to tell us what's the correct onsatz to use when we're trying to expand our our problem. And you can see this really fit into the framework that we just had. If g of epsilon was just equal to epsilon to the minus one half power, right? It almost works out, but you get the idea. Okay, something like that. Um. So we're going to play lots of games like this throughout the course. And knowing what to start with sometimes requires um, some intuition about the problem. Sometimes it uh, requires us just to guess and get started and see where that assumption takes us. If you lead to a contradiction, then probably the assumption that you started with was wrong. And you need to try something else, right? If you lead to something that doesn't lead to a contradiction, then you might be right, but you might be wrong, okay? So uh, that's where theory comes in. Uh, and theory in this class will be sometimes sparse in some locations, especially when we're dealing with like radical, radically complicated nonlinear problems <laughs> where we don't have much linear structure or any linear structure to lean on. Uh, we just kind of have to guess and throw things at a problem and hope that they produce the right sorts of uh, things. And sometimes you get an answer out. Again, you're not going to lead to any logical contradictions and you just have to say, well, maybe that's right. And that's when, when that happens, you say, uh, you, you can do things like, well, I don't know if this is 100% rigorously accurate, but I might compare to uh, numerical results and then see if the numerical results agree for a certain regime. So I sold this course to you as numerics free, right? No numerics, but you sometimes have to do numerics in conjunction with asymptotic approximations or analytical techniques to kind of determine whether one is right and the other is wrong or both are right, both are wrong sort of things, okay? Ah, we are done. Slide deck number one is kicked. Any questions before we move on to the second deck? Part two. Is the principle like a proven thing or is it just, has it been checked? You know, to be honest with you, I don't really know uh, how, I don't know how rigorous it is. I'll tell you, it works, and sometimes it doesn't work. And if it works, then what mathematicians tend to do is they'll use a heuristic technique, or physicists as well, they use a heuristic technique to construct solutions 
And then once you've got the solution constructed, you can go back and then do error estimates on it and say, now that I have this constructed, how good is it? And uh, it seems like that that might not be a good way to go, but sometimes that's the only way to go. You don't have theory telling you, giving you the roadmap to get to a destination. But if you get to a certain destination, you can check it to see if it's the right thing. So I can't say for sure, given these assumptions about a problem, uh, method of dominant balance works this time, this time, this time, and this time, or always works in this scenario. Uh, sometimes it's, it's a little bit like you, you try it, you get a constructed solution, then you come back and say, uh, now I have a solution, let's test it using analysis and see if it works or, or if it's a good approximation. Part two of motivating themes. So the next thing we're gonna study is a regular perturbation initial value problem. And an initial value problem is one where it's a differential equation or a system of differential equations where I have a value of the solution at a certain, certain single point. Um, I might have derivative information, function information, or a combination of both derivatives and functional information, but only at a single point in space. And then I have to solve my equation away from that. Um, there are different types of problems we're going to look at in the course. Initial value problems won't take up too much of our space, but we will examine them from time to time. The other problem that we're going to look at a bit more frequently are, are, are problems that are called boundary value problems, where we have um, a differential equation which has information at two different points in space, or maybe along a boundary or something like that where that information along the boundary controls the solution in the interior of some domain or interval or something like that. So this isn't necessarily going to be the typical problem that we solve here. And in fact, it's kind of an easier-ish type of problem, but uh, it is uh, going to be uh, useful for us in determining how things work. So in this case, we're going to study uh, a problem that is modeling the motion of a projectile. Actually, it's a very simple kind of motion because we're only gonna imagine the ball or a hard sphere, something dense and massive that goes up and then it goes right back down. Okay, only it stays in the same line, right? Same tube. So this one seems to indicate that it kind of goes off to the side a little bit. No, it just goes straight up and straight back down. And so the distance that we measure from the surface of the earth, that's gonna be called X. So the height above the surface of the earth, X. It goes straight up. So X is positive, 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 And then it comes back down to zero eventually. So it's not a very sophisticated motion like real projectile motion, which would be you know, shooting something like in, in a certain direction. But it's not hard to come up with that model once you know how to deal with this model. So let's look at the force due to gravity exerted on the small dense ball that we're throwing up in the air. So that small ball is going to have mass little m. The mass of the earth, which is somewhat bigger, is mass capital M. We have the gravitational constant the force acting on this is in the direction of the center of gravity of the Earth. So that's why negative and our coordinate system is X is positive in this direction. Um, and we're dividing by the total distance this is from the center of the Earth. So if the center of the Earth has, or if the Earth has radius capital R, then, and this has distance, x from the surface of the earth, then the total distance from the center of the ball is going to be r plus x. And we have to square that. So somebody pointed out in the notes in previous slides that the square was uh, off in the wrong place. Uh, I corrected that. So I think it's, it's okay now. Okay, so those are all the parameters that we have in this model. 
And the other thing that this um, this example is going to show us how to do is um, to non-dimensionalize and to really understand where small parameters come from in physical models. There's a saying in applied math that goes, be wise, non-dimensionalize, right? It's probably a, it's truly a saying from engineering and you engineers probably can claim that fairly, but since we're mostly mathematicians here, we'll we'll say it's a mathematic statement. Applied math, be wise, non-dimensionalize. If you wanna see where, actually I've learned this from physicists and engineers, so it's, it's more fairly uh, an engineering saying. Uh, so this is gonna tell us where small parameters arise in our model, okay? And we're gonna eliminate all the extraneous parameters we're going to show actually in this in this setting there's really only one parameter okay now it looks like that's not possible because we have a bunch of parameters appearing in our in our model in addition to the initial velocity so we're going to try to get rid of all of those so we're going to use newton's uh uh law to uh to uh uh create equations of motion uh, what is second law, third, no, second law, I think, um, F equals MA. So the, uh, acceleration is the second time derivative of the position, which is X. Okay. So X is the only thing changing in the model. So that's what our variable will be. X will be a function of time. So the second time derivative is what we call the acceleration and F solving F equals MA means that A has to be equal to this, uh, um, this right? So uh, I just divide both sides by little m. So little m actually doesn't matter in the problem. Um, now it does whenever you're talking about wind resistance and things like that. So we're neglecting the uh, effects of friction and, uh, and drag and things like that. The only thing that's coming into play here is the gravitational effect. So we're going to init, or we're going to assume that the ball starts at time zero at x equals zero, and it shoots up. And the only way that that can happen, if it starts at this position zero, for something to happen, we need to give it an initial velocity, right? And um, this is a good problem if you want to calculate things like escape velocity. Then you really have to use a model like this, where you take into consideration the fact that you're not in a constant gravitational field. If you go higher, you feel the effects of gravity gravity less and less as you get further away. Any questions about the setup? Okay, so we're going to non-dimensionalize this problem. The way we non-dimensionalize is we're going to uh, create a dimensionless time and a dimensionless distance. The dimensionless time is going to be tau. That's equal to the real time divided by some T star, which is a characteristic time. So the characteristic time T star is unspecified now, but it's going to be some positive number. It's going to have units of seconds because our original time had units of seconds. So if I divide seconds by seconds, I get a unitless number. And that's that thing I'm going to call tau. But I'm going to hold off describing or saying how I'm going to pick T star until a little bit later. All right. And we're also going to introduce a uh, dimensionless position, and that's going to be called Y. And I can figure that as a function of tau or T, doesn't matter. Um, if I figure it as a function of tau, X is naturally a function of T, but T is equal to tau times T star. So y of tau is x of tau times t star, and by definition, it's going to be divided by x star, where x star is a fundamental distance or a characteristic distance. That means x star has units of um, meters, probably working in meters. Uh, so y is unitless because x is in units of meters and x star is in units of meters, so y has no units, it's a dimensionless number. Now I need to convert the derivatives. The way I convert the derivatives is I'm going to have uh, 
this is a very simple equation. I have to convert this second derivative. There's no first derivatives in here. Okay, this can come by a very simple replacement. So just one derivative that I have to uh, convert, and that's the second derivative. But to do that, we, we go through the process of converting the first derivative. To convert the first derivative, we're gonna use the chain rule because I'm gonna convert uh, to this y where y has this definition. Um, so I need to take a derivative or convert the, the derivative with respect to the usual time to a derivative with respect to dimensionless time. So I'm gonna use the chain rule. I'm gonna think about writing x as a function of t, or sorry, tau times t star, which is fine because that's what t is equal to. It's tau times t star. So if I really want to take a derivative of x with respect to tau, I have to first take the derivative of tau with respect to t and then take the derivative of x with respect to tau, okay? The way I remember how to do the chain rule is I always pretend like I can cancel units there, right? And so I'm just back to the usual t derivative. But if I solve everything out, I'm going to get an x star over t star dy d tau as a function now only of tau. In the end, I replace, I really do make this full replacement here. You may have to monkey around with this a few times to see what's going on here. It always kind of scrambles my brain until I think about it, but it's not, it's not so bad. Likewise, the second derivative gets replaced uh, with x uh, star over t star squared d2y d tau squared as a function of tau. Okay, but the important thing here is that there's now going to be a prefactor in my uh, expression for my derivative. Now, the units have to work out to be the same. Now, what are the units of the second derivative of position with respect to time? That's going to be units of length over units of time squared, right? This is dimensionless, completely dimensionless, because I'm taking the derivative of a dimensionless quantity with respect to a dimensionless parameter. So there's no dimensions on this guy. That means you could argue simply by um, kind of dimensional analysis or uh, a dimensions uh, anal analysis only that this has to be the right answer because the dimensions have to come out. Now you might get dimension. You might get the exact numbers exact. You might get the exact numbers wrong, but you'll you'll probably end up with the right answer. Now this guy here, x star over t star squared has the right units. It's dimensions of length over dimensions of time squared. Okay, so the the dimensions match up. So now when I make all the replacements, I get this derivative, second derivative. Now that's completely dimensionless. And I'm going to throw this guy over to the other side by multiplying by the reciprocal. Okay. So then I'm also going to divide by R squared everywhere you see. That brings the R that was down here out. And I just get a one. And so uh, I get epsilon here after doing the clearing all the details is just equal to X star over R. That again is also a length, or sorry, a unitless number because it's length over length or distance over distance. Now, how big is X star compared to R star? Well, it depends on what my X star is, but I'm probably going to take X star to be a couple hundred meters compared to R, capital R, which is anybody? No, not quite that big. Yeah, it's an order of uh, ten, you know, thousands of kilometers, right? So this number is pretty small. Epsilon is pretty small, right? Okay, but what about this number here? Well, I can choose my characteristic height and characteristic time, so that simply becomes a one, right? I still haven't picked out what this should be, but I'm going to say the pairing of the two should contrive to make everything else here equal to one. I'm allowed to do that. And it still doesn't completely nail down what I should choose for my time scale and my space scale. That's only one equation. I have two parameters, so I need two equations to completely nail down the two separate parameters. 
So I'm going to make this a one. And so you can see the structure of the equation emerging that I'm going to use. This is a one, one here and an epsilon here. And I'm going to imagine epsilon is probably going to be small. Now I have an initial velocity to consider. The initial velocity converts in the following way. V naught has to be equal to X star over T star times the derivative of dy d tau. So this is unitless. And I can multiply this guy to the other side, right? So I'm allowed to take then and choose, if possible, to make to pick X star and T star such that this initial velocity with respect to dy d tau becomes also one. So if I set that equal to one and solve, that's two equations now, two unknowns, that gives me X star equals to this quantity and T star equals that. You can check that this actually does give you a time scale and this actually does give you a space scale, all right? And you can do a back of the envelope calculation to say, well, okay, given my initial velocity, is this guy really small or not? You know how big G is, and you know how big the mass of the Earth is. You know how big the radius of the Earth is. So now if your velocity, your initial velocity isn't too large, then we can be guaranteed that X star is going to be small compared to the radius of the Earth, okay? So that's how dimensional analysis goes. But now let's assume that Everything works out so that that epsilon does work out to be small. So this is a physical problem. Epsilon is some finite number. It's some number, okay? And it depends on your initial velocity and the other parameters you don't have control over, like the size of the Earth and the radius of the Earth, et cetera. Um, but now we have a problem here that involves a small parameter, which is fixed, but still small. So the question is, can we come up with a perturbative solution to a problem like this using the techniques that we've used for algebraic equations? For example, can we assume that uh, we have a solution on Zots, which is a power series expansion in epsilon, plug it in, solve for powers, and then get a solution, which is which is uh, useful and, and accurate? Well, I'm, I'm going to go through this in detail the next time we meet, but the, the answer is yes. For small values of epsilon, we can construct a power series expansion or approximation, which is a pretty good representation of the true solution. Now, this isn't comparing the true solution to the exact solution. This is comparing the computed approximation to the solution where epsilon is equal to zero, Okay, the so-called base case or limiting case. So we'll talk more about this next time. <clears throat> Sorry, next time. And uh, <clears throat> I will see you then. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email <clears throat> or come up after class. Um, so until next time, or that you come up and visit me or send me an email, have a good day.